stated, today we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 17. And um, this is a familiar portion of scripture. This is the David and Goliath uh, story. And uh, so we're going to see this battle between that which seems overpowering and that which seems unequipped to be able to fight the battle. And I, this whole story is a very familiar metaphor on how a lot of times those to whom you think are the strongest oftentimes are the ones that fall often and fall quicker. Um, you would almost think if you were to look at Goliath and you say, well, as far as man is concerned, if we had to deal with Goliath, which Bible character would we put against Goliath? Both of us would say, oh, I'm going to go get Samson. Because Samson was God's big, strong guy, right? So I'm going to I'm, I'm get Samson to fight against him. But we know that Samson wasn't all that great when it came down to fighting the Philistines. Because Samson got taken down not by a mighty Goliath. Samson got taken down by who? By a Philistine woman. All right? Because Samson had, he had some issues. All right? But God, that's why we have to keep in mind, God does things differently. He's not going to always try to to fight might with might. He fights with different things. And so he's going to fight this uh, fierce foe with faith, the faith that David has. And so we'll see that picture on today. And um, uh, we certainly will uh, kind of try to point out some things that we can use in our everyday walk with the Lord. But with that being said, let's go ahead and get the reading in. Let's take a listen here. Um, 1 Samuel chapter 17. And saying, So shall it be done to them. Let me start it from the beginning. Chapter 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and were gathered together at Shocho, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shocho and Azekah in Ephes Dalmim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There was a valley between them, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass, and he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders, and the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron. One bearing of shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel, and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose your man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man went among them for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons that went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of this parched corn, and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and left the sheep with a keeper, and took and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. 
And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, <laughs> Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him. <laughs> for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him, and he took his staff in his hand, and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook, and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had, even in a scrip. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, and ruddy, and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog, that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air, and to the beasts of the field. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee, and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose, and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag, and took thence a stone, and slang it, and smote the Philistine in his forehead, that the stone sunk into his forehead, and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone, and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword 
and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way of Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. All chapter right. 17. All right, so there we go. First Samuel chapter 17. Very familiar uh, scripture. Good morning, Wayne. Good morning. And so what we see here is a, a, a very familiar uh, story. It's a long story, and we'll, we should be able to get through this. But it's beautiful in its sense because it brings forth a, a very, um, I think, foundational and fundamental point. And I think that's why it's such a familiar story. That no matter how big the enemy of the world is, God is always bigger. And God will always bring down that which seemingly is undefeatable. We can't win against this. You know that old saying, you can't fight City Hall. Remember those people used to always say that saying? Well, uh, God can. God can bring down any system. He can bring down any uh, a structure that goes against God. And that's what this story is all about. And it shows you that you don't have to fight with the things that the world fights with. But you can fight with the things that God has given you. Uh, the scripture says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are spiritual and mighty to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what the, uh, the Philistine uh, champion Goliath represents. A stronghold that nobody seems to be able to find a way to defeat. But God will always give us a way past that which is undoable for us, but doable for God. God can do those things. All right. So it starts off and it says, now the Philistines gathered together their armies. And I'm going to kind of read through a lot of this kind of fast, just so that we can, you know, make sure we have the, 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 uh, the picture. So the Philistines are gathered together in Sukkoth, um, of, of Judah. Let's see, so I see Regina's joining. Let me let her in. All right. And, um, and that's what verse 1 is telling us. And in verse 2, it lets us know that um, it says, And Saul and his men in, in Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elon and uh, set the battle in array. Um, good morning, Regina. We're on 1 Samuel chapter 17. The, good morning. The, the familiar story of David and Goliath. All right. And so what we see here... But, uh, from verses 1, 2, and 3, is that Israel and the Philistine army are come together. Now, they're not actually fighting. The battle hasn't really got into a deep uh, uh, skirmish yet. But they're sitting on two different sides of, of very high hills or mountains with a valley in between. And they're kind of at a standoff. Okay? And so uh, verse 4 picks it up and it says, and there went out the champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, who uh, of Gath, whose height was six uh, cubits and a span. Okay, a cubit is usually the distance between the elbow and the and the tip of the finger. Uh, and usually, they would measure that by what king was ruling, and usually that's about eighteen inches. And then a span was the distance that your hand could open up. And from the tip of your pinky to the tip of your thumb would be a span. Well, when you look at that together and you go, okay, well, you got, uh, you know, 18 inches plus a span, which could be about another nine inches. Um, it would seem that Goliath was around nine feet, nine inches tall. So almost 10 feet. 
you know, in between nine and ten feet. All right, so he was a big dude. And he was part of that. Remember when the Bible told us that there were uh, giants in the land in the days uh, before the flood and after that? Well, this is that after that aspect where we see these giants showing up. We saw that we were, when they went from uh, Egypt and they were going into the promised land that they saw what? Giants in the land. And they said, we look like grasshoppers. So there was still this aspect of these huge uh, Rephaim or Nephilim type people. We talked about how one town was called the town of Bashan seemed to have all of those uh, giants within it. And we talked about how when you look at the city of Bashan, it talks about the mingling of evil spirits with humanity's intelligence. Um, and uh, there's a lot that we can keep in mind. But what you see here is Goliath as being a giant having the remnants of the fallen angels still empowering them. And the, 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 the demonic or, 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 or devilish nature, when it interacts with men, can make men look bigger than what they are. Now, a lot of times it's stature, but sometimes it's in a lot of other things, such as political power or, or, or um, uh, capital with money or with uh, power of industry. There's a lot of ways that the devil empowers those whom he follows to make them bigger than what they see. We see in the news already with, you know, with uh, this, you know, Pete, uh, Sean Combs, and he was a big individual when it came down to money, but you can see how he was. And there's a whole lot of stuff we could say about that, but I'm, I'm just going to mention that and move on. But a lot of uh, high circumstances. Goliath's statue was just his, his size and his strength. And we know he was strong because when you look at verse 5, it tells you that he had a helmet of brass was on his head. Uh, he, had, uh, he was armed with a coat of nails or, or males. In other words, he was wearing chains as clothes. Uh, uh, the weight of his coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. I mean, just the clothes he was wearing, you had to be a strong person to wear that armor. And then in verse 6, it tells us that um, uh, he had uh, brass uh, coverings upon his legs. Um, uh, the target of his brass was between his shoulders. He had, you know, all this armor, this, this heavy armor, and he was able to carry it, you know, with no problem. Verse 7 tells us that the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spearhead weighed uh, 600 shekels. That's probably about eight or nine pounds. All right, and and um, and one beam of uh, of his shield went before him. So he had one person. Uh, I'm sorry, one bearing his shield went before him. So he had a shield, and the shield you had to have a a, a person just to carry his shield. That's how big and how uh, how heavy it was. So it's showing you all this stature of Goliath. Look at how powerful he is. And so once again, how do you measure the strength when it comes down to the things of the world? How big is it? How much power do they have? How much money do they have? How much control do they have? How much political power do they have? All of these things are the things that the world uses to manipulate and control. And what Goliath was doing was using his size to put fear in the heart of God's people. We should not have fear. We should have faith. But boy, does this world and this whole system and the, and the enemy and the, and the spiritual evilness of, of, of our day has the ability to put fear in us. We've all been there to some degree or, an, or another where we were worried and afraid and upset and angry and disappointed because we were fearful about what was going on. And a lot of times we we felt that way. And then afterwards, we saw how God delivered us. And what we should keep in mind is try to remember how fearful you were when you were having that moment back in the past and how God turned that moment into something that you were able to handle and deal with. Didn't say it turned it in perfect. Didn't say it went, it went the way you wanted it. It's just that you were able to what? Get past it and handle it. Right? And you should always remember that. Keep that in our minds that God will bring us through when the odds seem to be unfair, right? And it should be, it was like, well, it's unfair that, that the Philistines have a man of that size. We don't have anybody that can measure up to him. 
Well, this is what we want to try to learn and, and pull from this story. All right, verse 8 says, and he stood crying unto the uh, armies of Israel. So now he's bragging about you guys are not worth anything. He's taunting, telling them, like people tell you, tell us, well, you just have to believe in a God you can't see because you use it as a crutch. And they tell us there is no real God. You just need something that you can lean on because your ability to stand on your own two feet is weak. You need to believe in your own might and your own strength. And they will taunt and tell us that us trusting in God is just a, a problem of our own ability to deal with reality. No, my trusting in God is because I believe God is who he say he is. And I lean on that. But uh, Goliath is taunting him. And so he stood crying to the armies of Israel, saying unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? I am uh, not a Philistine, yet uh, the servant of Saul. Choose you a man, all right, and let him come down to me. So Saul, uh, Goliath is saying, all you folks that follow me, Saul, get your, get your best guy and send him down to me. All right? And look what he says. And if, I, if he be able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servant. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then ye shall be our servant and serve us. All right, so what's happening here? The devil's trying to make a deal. All right, and the, the issue is, no matter how the battle goes, you can't agree to serve the enemy. Well, that's look like I'm getting beat. I guess I'm going to have uh, to allow the enemy to lead me. No. No matter how bad it gets, you still will win. And that's what the scripture tells us. The Bible tells us that what? We are more than overcomers. If we're in who? Christ Jesus. All right. So if we're following the Lord, we will win. And you go, well, but my sure look like I'm losing now, but that don't matter. We've all seen those, those uh, boxing matches where somebody is just getting beat up for the whole fight. And then at the last moment, they were able to throw a punch and knock the guy out. Right? We've seen that. We've seen the, the situations. Remember when uh, Mike Tyson was fighting Buster Douglas? Remember that fight? Well, if you remember in that fight, that at, at, before Mike Tyson lost the fight, Mike Tyson actually knocked Buster Douglas down. And it looked like, well, that's it. Another victim. But he got back up and continued to fight. Now, that's just a metaphorical aspect that I'm using of a story that's real life to, to paint a picture on what God can do for us. Yeah, you may get knocked down. And yeah, you may get hurt. And the battle that you're fighting looks like you're coming up against somebody that's never been beaten, man. This guy's never lost a battle. But God can still bring you through. And that's what this uh, whole story is trying to get us to see. All right? So don't agree to serve the devil, no matter what circumstances they try to offer you. He will always try to give you, well, if this happens, then you come on over to our side and we'll, we'll, we'll make it, you know, okay for you. No, we don't want to agree to that. All right. Uh, verse 11 starts off and it says, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the, of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Saul, the king, and all the people were dismayed. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to handle this. Well, why? Because remember, our back story is what kind of condition is Saul in? Saul is in a stage where God has already what? Rejected him. Rejected. Yeah. And so Saul now is not in a stage where he's going to seek God for the, victory, for the victory. So if you're looking at Goliath and you're looking at the average guy going up against him, yeah, you're going to be afraid. Because that's not a, a fair match. There's no way you can win. So you will be dismayed or confused and you will be afraid. You're running from uh, how to handle it with fear. All right, but look at the very next verse. Now, Davis, ah, here we go. Somebody that's got some faith. How do we know? Well, let's keep reading about David and see how David chooses to approach the matter. Saul approached it by looking at the size 
and realizing we can't match the size. So we're going to be dismayed and confused and we're going to be fearful and afraid. And we're not going to do anything. We're going to be in a stalemate. We're going to, be, we're going to sit there frozen. All right? Now, verse 12 says, Now David, the son of the, the Ephraimite of Bethlehem, whose name was Jesse. David was uh, the son of Jesse. And he had eight sons. We already learned that from the last uh, uh, chapter when Samuel went down to anoint uh, David king. Right? And we saw how David was put aside out there feeding the sheep and they brought all the sons up and none of them were the ones that God had chosen. God had chosen David. And then we saw how the circumstances happened when the evil spirit came on Saul and they found out that David was a man that could play the harp. And when he went down to play the harp for Saul, the evil spirit left Saul for that particular time. So David already had a way of, of, of entering in and going out into the uh, presence of Saul. All right? And so now we're seeing here that David is now uh, being uh, brought into this picture when it comes to Goliath. All right? And uh, he had eight sons. And look at verse 13. And it says, the three eldest sons of Jesse uh, went and followed Saul to the battle. Now remember, when Samuel came to Jesse, and said, God has sent me to anoint sons. Uh, Jesse sent, brought his first three sons out. And they thought, well, this must be the one. But God said, nope, don't look at their stature. You look at the, how people look, but God looks upon the what? The heart. So we know that David has a heart after, is after, is after God. His heart is uh, a heart after God. All right, so it goes and says, uh, and the names of the sons were Eliab, uh, Abinadab, and, and Shammah. All right, so these were David's oldest son. I mean, sorry, David's oldest brothers. And they're down there, you know, already following Saul. And they're following a leader that has been what? Rejected by God. Got to be careful that we, you don't follow somebody that God is not with. God, uh, uh, Samuel is still the king of Israel. He's still one of the, uh, 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 the Israelites' leaders. But he's not being led by God. And you can see this because Samuel has, I'm sorry, Saul has no sense of how to bring victory. He's in a stalemate. And there are people following him. And because Saul is afraid, everybody else is afraid. All right. Look at 14. And David was the youngest. And, uh, and the three eldest brothers followed Saul. All right, David was the youngest one, we told, 15. But David went and returned from Saul to feed uh, his father's sheep at Bethlehem. Okay, verse 15 is letting us know that he went back and forth to Saul. He would go to Saul. And why was he going to Saul? Remember from our last chapters? To play the harp when the evil spirit came on Saul. All right? And then he would leave that and go back to his father's sheep. So he was still going back and forth between Saul and taking care of his sheep. How many brothers did David have, you said? Eight. Seven? Yeah, eight. yeah there were eight. eight of them. So he had, uh, there was, uh, he had seven other brothers. All right. And so uh, 16. And the Philistines drew near, uh, near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. So the Philistine Goliath, he went up there in the morning and in the evening. The devil is relentless. I'm going to make you feel bad in the morning and I'm going to try to make you feel bad in the, in the evening. I'm going to have you wake up with fear and have you go to sleep with fear. That's what the devil wants to do. That's all he wants. Can I keep you in this state of fear? We got this election coming up. And how many people are fearful that the person they want to get in the office might not get in there? And what you going to do if the person you don't want gets in? What you going to have? Fear? We should not. We should not. It don't matter who gets in. It don't. If, if one gets in or the other, it don't change who God is. Amen. And, and that's what we got to remember. So don't get all dismayed if the person you want to get in doesn't get in. Don't all get upset and be up all mad and, and join the pity parties and the conversations that you're going to see in your community and in your jobs and all. Just tell folks it's okay because the one thing that we do know, they didn't vote God out of office. Amen. They didn't do that. So we're going to continue to have faith in what God is doing. 
So now Jesse, verse 17, uh, uh, Jesse said to David, his son, take now thy, uh, thy brother an ephod of, of parched corn and uh, these 10 loaves and run to the camp of thy brother. And in verse 18 it says, and carry these 10 cheeses to the captain of the thousands and look how thy, thy brethren fare and take their pledges. In other words, get them, get some statements on what they're saying. Tell me how they're doing. Have them write me a letter. Let me know how they're doing. So now what Jesse don't know, he's saying, just go down there, give this little, uh, uh, token of food and thanks to the captains and to your brothers and then find out how they're faring. Now what Jesse don't know, he's sending the man down there to get the victory. Jesse has no idea. He's just sending some food, some bread, and some cheese. And he's trying to get word as to what's going on. But God, God uses some of the smallest little incidental things that we do. And right now, what Jesse just did was sent the victor, the one that's going to win the battle, down to the fight. And sometimes you'd be surprised how, how God just moves with, with something that seems like insignificant, but that little change, that little uh, deviation from what you were normally doing. So Jesse says, leave those sheep from now, and I want you to go down to the battle. He's not sending them down to the battle to fight. He's sending them down to the battle to feed the people that are fighting. But he had no idea what God was doing. And that's something we should keep in mind. God will move you to one place to another, and you have no idea that God is moving you there because he's a, this is how he's going to give you the victory. Amen. All right, and so you're going to get the victory there. All right, and so verse 19, it says, Now Saul and they uh, and all the men of Israel were in the valley of, of Eklon fighting with the Philistines. They're down there battling back and forth. Not with swords and spears yet. And, and they're battling with what? Words and strategic situations. They're sitting on one side of the, the mountain on one side and the other side is the Israel army, and they're trying to figure out how we can get an advantage. But they can't get an advantage because everybody in Israel is afraid of Goliath. Verse 20. And David arose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. So he got up, did what his father told him to do. But he didn't leave the sheep abandoned. He left them with a what? Another caretaker. It sounds like what Jesus says. He said, I'm going to have to go but I will not lead you comfortless. Comfort. I will send I will you in another comfort. Amen. All right? And so that's what David did. He, he, he said, I'm watching over these sheep. These sheep are my sheep. And I'm not going to leave them without a comforter, without a protector. So he put another key, a, a keeper and took and went as Jesse commanded him. And he came uh, to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight. And shouted for the battle. So he's down there right in the midst of all this shouting that's going back and forth. They're not fighting. They're yelling and screaming and hollering and shouting at each other. They're throwing insults. Look at 21. And Israel and the Philistine had put their battle in array. Army against army. They're standing up there. But they're, all they're doing is doing what? Having a staring contest. But God's about to change all this. It seems like, well, now I looked at the circumstance. It's the same today. You know, sometimes you can look at a, a problem. Sometimes you can get some mail, look at a bill. All you can do is stare at it because you ain't got the money to pay it. It's just a staring <laughs> contest. You're just looking at it. But God is about to give you the victory, and you don't even know it. Oh, no, you stare at what you are staring at. God's about to fix. All right? All right, so they're, they're just doing this, you know, back and forth. Look at 22. And David left. Uh, his carriage um, in the hand of the keeper. So he took the carriage that he was carrying all that food with in the hand of the keeper and ran to the army and came down and saluted his brother. He came down and said, hello, boy. Hello, uh, 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 brothers. How are we going? How's it going? What's going on? He was probably very glad to see his brothers, see them doing well. They weren't hurt. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion of the Philistines of, uh, of, of Gath, Goliath. So while he's down there saying hi to his brother, all of a sudden, guess who shows up? The devil. Goliath. 
And you going, I'm, I'm going to go down to the family reunion. I'm going to go see my family. I'm going to go see how Paul's doing. And while you're going there, guess who shows up? <laughs> the devil. Yeah. You think you're just going to go see what's going on. And all of a sudden, here comes Goliath with insults. All right. Um, and so it says, Goliath by name out of the army of the Philistine and spake according to the same words. And David heard him. So David's like, he's hearing something. And David's like, wait a minute. This don't sound right. <clears throat> Sometimes you can hear something. You can be like, and the spirit within you will be like, oh no, this ain't the right thing to do. And David was hearing what he was saying. Look at 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him. When the, when the Goliath came, they ran. And that's a lot of times what we do. When the devil shows up, we run. We get scared. We try to find some place to hide. And, and while we're running, look what it says. They, they, they fled from him and were sore afraid. We got to find ways when we feel. See, I'm not going to tell you that you're never going to be afraid. But I want your fear and I want my fear. And when, whenever we seem to, to have fear come up, let it be a trigger to begin to muster faith. You're going to fear. If you're living in this world, the devil will always come up and he will, he will roar at you. He will roar. He will, he will sneer at you. And you will get startled in life and get afraid. But when you do, think, wait a minute. God said for us not to be afraid, but to walk by faith. Let me, and then you pray, ask God, God, help me to transform this fear into faith. Give me the ability, Lord, to stand on faith in you and not in the fear that I have in my circumstances. Can we just muster that attitude to be able to do those things when it does arise? Because you're going to have your Goliaths in your life. They will show up and they will say things to you that are not pleasant. Look at what we see here. Our 25. And all the men of Israel said, have ye seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich it. So they're letting you know, there's a reward if you do stand up to the devil. All right, the king is going to give you what? The man that gets, he will enrich him with great riches and will uh, give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So you're going to get riches. You're going to get to marry into the family of the king and you're going to be free from paying taxes, you and your family. So look at all this reward that you're going to get. All right. Now, why do you get this? Well, these are just uh, things that follow an individual that will do what God is empowering them to do. Now, the thing about it, this is what Saul is going to give, but Saul himself won't go do it. So he's, he knows he needs a man with courage and a man with faith. But Saul knows he does not have the courage and he does not have the faith, but yet he's the leader. So here's a, a weak leader looking for somebody that's a little better than him. But we already were told that. That's what Samuel said when Samuel uh, told Saul that God had rejected him and has chosen a man that is better than him. Remember that from our last chapter? And so um, Saul's not doing what he wants somebody else to do. And we'll, I will give you all this wonderful stuff if you can do what I'm afraid to do. Saul's not the one, but thank God David is. 26. And David spake uh, to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth the Philistine? So, so David heard that. He's like, Wait a minute. He wants to make, What did y'all say was going to happen? All right. And, uh, and taketh away the reproach from Israel. That's the added thing that David puts on there. What did you say would happen to the man that takes, takes away this, uh, uh, this person? And the reproach. 
the stain, all right, the attitude that all God's folks, all the Israelite people are scared. They're all fearful. They're all I'm in church. They're all running from the things that uh uh, uh, that, that are coming up against them. All right? And so, and then he goes on, who is this, and look what David says. Now, see, David's already upset. He said, who is this uncircumcised Philistines that he should defy the armies of the living God? David's already going on to prophesy. He's not standing on fear. He's standing on faith. And so he said, who is this guy? That's what, remember when Jesus came up against the demons, he would say, what is your name? Why? Because Jesus was not afraid of the devils. He was not afraid of these demons. He went and told them, what is your name? And then he would cast them out. Well, David's doing the same thing. What's the name of this, uh, of this uh, uh, warrior, this demon warrior? And uh, I'm going to cast him out. All right? All right. And so he says, uh, and then he calls them uncircumcised size ballistic. So what does that mean? What is the circumcision a part of? That's a, 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 a covenant identifier. If you are circumcised, you're part of the, of the Israeli covenant or the Abrahamic covenant. So what he's saying is this person has no covering. He has no covenant with God. This is a person that doesn't want to have anything to do with God. They're uncircumcised. And I think it's a double thing because he's also, he's also talking about the man's genitals. <laughs> That's kind of like one of the things that you can have as just, well, I'm going to talk about you in the, I'm, I'm going to hit you where it hurts. You just uncircumcised. Right? You, don't have the, you don't have done what should be done in order for you to be a covenant follower. And then he goes on. Look at verse 27. And the people answered uh, after him this matter, saying, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And they just repeated what they already said. Riches, the daughter, and you don't have to pay taxes. Uh, 28. And then uh, uh, Elahab, oh, I couldn't get that out. The, the oldest brother of David spake saying unto the men of uh, Elahab's uh, anger kindled against David. So now the oldest son of Jesse um, is upset at what David is saying. And his anger was kindled against David. And look what he says. Why comest thou hither? Why are you here? Well, he was here because his father Jesse sent him. And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Well, we already know David left his sheep with the what? With another keeper. He didn't leave him there by himself. And so his oldest brother's like, well, who did you leave? But he didn't say the sheep. He said those what? Few sheep. You don't even got a whole lot of sheep, David. He's, so now he's trying to embarrass David. Why are you up here? And who did you leave those few sheep with? You ain't got but four or five sheep. Why are you up here anyway? Go back. And a lot of times, uh, even people that are standing on the side of God, but still afraid to do what God can empower them to do, will try to embarrass you because you have chosen to do what God has told you to do. And they're mad because they won't do it. Um, Elab had the same opportunity to go fight Goliath in the power of God. But the problem is Elab doesn't know God like David knows God. And that's one of the things that we... So when other people, especially other Christians, try to criticize you for what you're doing, don't get upset with them because they just don't know God like you know God. They may at some point in time, but they're going to see God work in you. And yes, they may even try to throw some little snide remarks. Who did you leave those little few sheep with? You ain't got a whole lot going on. You're not very powerful. God ain't using you. You're not mighty. You ain't got no big cathedral. You ain't got no big TV ministry. You ain't got none of this stuff going on. You know, there's little few things that you got going on. What are you doing with that? That's okay. Because God can, can win the battle. With, remember what Jonathan said? He said, we can win the battle with few or with many. And I said, remember that. No, I'm going ahead of myself. We haven't gotten there yet. 
Um, but um, oh yeah, we did. Yeah, we did read that one. I'm sorry. And so the, the problem is God can win with a lot, and He can win with a few. We saw that with Gideon. Remember, He told Gideon, "Send some of them people home." Because we don't need all those people there. We want some people that can just believe on what we have said. And look what the brother continues to say. He said, I know thy pride. So now the brother is saying that David is operating in pride. No. See, he's saying something that's not true. And sometimes other people that are on the Lord's side will say things to you, criticizing you that's not true. Because they don't know you. He's not operating in pride. And he says, and the naughtiness of thy heart. He goes, I know the naughtiness of your heart. All right? So, I mean, he's saying, I know you, David. I know how you can be. Well, later on, we're going to see that David does have some naughtiness in his heart. But he also is a man after God's own heart. And that we'll see how those things will battle out. We'll get to that down the road. For thou have come down that thou might see the battle. You just want to come down here and see what's going on. You want to be nosy. So the brother is just saying all these insults. To David, his own brother. Not only are they both on uh, Israel, they're both fighting for the Lord, but they're both got the same father and mother. And boy, sometimes, you know, the person you would figure that would have your back just doesn't have your back. But you got to keep on going anyway. David, you don't see nowhere where David stood up and slapped him for saying that. David just took it. And sometimes we got to take it. What did Jesus say? If somebody smites you on one, one, one uh, cheek, turn he to him now. Also. All right. And so David just took it. All right. And he's just like, I didn't do anything. Well, look what he says in verse 30. And he turned uh, from him uh, towards another and spake after the same manner. Uh, and the people uh, answered him again after the former matter. And when, Dave, and, and when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed him. Oh, I, skipped, I skipped something. What did I skip? 29. 29. I, I, I did. That's right. Thank you. Let's go back to 29. And David said, what have I done now? So David said to the brother, what have I done now? What did I do? Why, why are you insulting me? Right? Is, is there not a, a cause? Do you have a reason we're supposed to be on the same side. We're supposed to be brothers. And you are insulting me because I'm trying to figure out a way that we can get victory over this uncircumcised Philistine. It says, and he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former words. If you go down there and you fight, you will get the victory. And David's like, I can do this. You know, tell me what I got to do and where I got to go. I, I'm ready to go. So David's like, we should, we should go ahead and do this. We shouldn't stand and let this man just criticize our God and ourselves. All right, 31. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul. And he sent for him. Saul heard that David's down there talking about, oh, I go down there and fight this guy. Who is this Goliath? He shouldn't be doing this. And Saul heard about it, and Saul said, well, go get that guy. And why does Saul want to go get that guy? Because Saul ain't going himself. <laughs> Saul is not going. Saul is not operating in the things of God. Saul is operating in fear. He does not have faith in God. All right? And so in 32, and David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. David's letting Saul know, I'll go and I'll fight this Philistine. I'll take him. I'll take him out. I'm, and what is he saying? He's speaking in how? In faith. How do you know that? Well, let's keep reading. Look at 33. And Saul uh, said unto David, thou art not able to go against the Philistine. So when they sent for David, and he, David came to Saul. Saul looked at him, and Saul's like, you're not able to fight. <laughs> you can't beat this guy, man. And look what Saul says. He says, for thou art a youth. He says, for thou art but a youth. And he a man of war from his youth. He's been fighting longer than you've been alive. 
Mm -hmm. Right? Look at 34. And David said unto Saul, thy servant kept his father's sheep. Now he's going back to his sheep, to the things he did. And he says, and there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb, took one of the young sheep out of the flock. 35. And I went after him. He said, I went after him just like I'm going to go after Goliath. <laughs> and smote him and delivered out of, the, uh, out of his mouth. And when uh, he arose against me, when I got the lamb, then the, the lion and the bear will come against me. And I caught him by his beard and smote uh, him and slew him. So he said, God helped me to fight a lion and a bear. David realized, I'm not bigger and stronger than a lion. I'm not bigger and stronger than a bear. So it must have been God. So David recognized God can deliver me in these kinds of battles. And he took that to faith. And that's it. So a lot of things that you can remember back in the day when you got victory over something that you, this, I should not have gotten victory over this. I should, I should still be in that problem, but I'm not. I got out of it. How did I get out of it? Well, that now can be the thing that you can stand on with great faith. That's the battle you can continue to fight because you already got the victory by the power of God. God's anointed you for that victory and brought you through it. All right, 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. See, he's comparing it. This is what David is doing. He's using intelligence to bring forth the faith that he has in God. God did it for me before. He's going to do it for me again. Seeing he had delivered the... Uh, 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 seeing he had defied the armies of the living God. Why am I going to do this? Because he's defied the armies of the living God. And why did David fight the lion and the bear? He didn't go out bear hunting. He didn't go out lion hunting. He went out after the lion and the bear because they came and took one of his lambs, one of his sheep. They, they went and uh, they were attacking that which I was in charge of. And he said, no, that ain't going to happen. And God gave him the faith and the courage. See, a lot of people got faith, but they ain't got no courage. And some people got courage, but they ain't got no faith. You need both. Be thou very courageous. Remember what uh, Moses told Joshua? Be thou of, 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 of a courage, of a courage uh, uh, have, have courage and, and have, uh, 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 be brave. And he told him to be, have courage and to be brave. All right. And so, and David says, moreover, the Lord, and here it is. This is 37. And David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. See, that's how David knows he's going to win. He's not going to, he said, I'm not going to win because I'm strong. I'm not going to win because I'm better. I'm going to win because God's going to give me the victory. That's what faith is all about. And Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with you. So, <laughs> Saul's like, all right, go. Saul's not going. And I can imagine Saul's like, all right, you going down there. And Saul's probably in his own mind thinking, well, he's just going to be another one slaughtered. And look at what Saul does. 38. And Saul armed David with his armor. So Saul's like, okay, you're going to fight the battle. You got to fight it the way I see a battle supposed to be fought. You don't have no, ba no battle gear. You don't even have a sword. You don't have anything. So I'm going to give you my stuff. I'm going to give you the stuff that I'm afraid to use to have you use it. And so, and David's like, okay, I'm going to listen to the king. And he put an helmet of brass upon his head. Also his armor with uh, the coat of, of, of males. Or just one of those strong uh, uh, mish, metal uh, uh, mishes that you would put on. 39. And David girded uh, his sword upon his armor and he uh, arrayed uh, to go. For um, he had not proven it. So he was kind of waiting. He was kind of like, I'm not ready to go because he hadn't done what? He hadn't proven the armor. Why? 
Because these weren't the tools that God anointed him to use. Right. And so therefore, David was uncomfortable. Now, he had the faith, he had the courage, but he allowed for a moment Saul to talk him in to putting on that which Saul wants him to fight with. But that's not what God's going to do. But David came to himself. And he said, I can't. He says, I, I have not proven this stuff. You're trying to put this stuff on me. And I'm, I'm, I'm being polite. And I appreciate you giving me these things to fight with. But I can't fight with this kind of stuff because I have not actually used it. I don't have the confidence that God will anoint me to win the battle with this stuff you've given me. All right. And so in verse 40, uh, he took uh, his staff. Uh, in his hand, and he chose five smooth stones out of a brook. He went to a brook and got some stones. Why? Because that's what David fights with. And he put uh, them in his shepherd bag, uh, which he had with him in his grip, and his sling was in his hand. So he's got a stone and a sling. That's what he's fighting with. And he drew near onto the Philistine. And the Philistine came on... <coughs> And drew near unto David. And the men that uh, bear his uh, shield went before him. So now, there you go. David with Goliath and the man that's carrying Goliath's shield. They're now standing ready to do battle. All before, it was all what going on? A lot of talk. Now, we're about to have some actual fight. 44. And when the Philistines uh, looked uh, about and saw David... He disdained him. He's like, what is this? And he uh, was but a youth and ruddy. He's just a little little kid. And was fit, but had a fair countenance. You sent this little doll baby looking kid after me to fight me? And you can imagine Goliath being insulted. And look what he said. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog that thou cometh to me with a staff? You got a staff? And he didn't see the sling and the smooth, small stone. You got a stick? You going to come at me? That's, that's, that's what you would take if you was fighting a dog. And so he said, okay. Um, and, and the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So now he's not only cursing David, he's cursing David by his gods. You trusting in that so-and-so God of Abraham. You trusting in that God of Saul. You trusting in that so-and-so God of Israel. He begins to, to just curse David. Once again, a, a war and a battle of what? Of words. And a lot of times, that's all the enemy can do is throw the words at you. But if you take the words to heart, you will get hurt. But if you just look at them as words. Remember that old thing that we used to say when we were kids? Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words can never harm me. It's, a, it's, it's not a biblical statement, but it's a good statement. Sometimes you just, just got to let stuff go off you. You saying all this stuff about me don't make it true. It don't say nothing. And so he keeps talking about David. Uh, at 44, and it says, uh, And the Philistine said uh, to David, Come to me, and I will give thy flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. I'm going to kill you and feed the birds by you. By, uh, by your remains. So he's basically saying, you're done already. So from a Goliath standpoint, this little boy is dead. 40, 45. And when David, then said David to the Philistine, thou cometh to me with a sword, and it was a big sword, right? He saw that. And with a spear, big old spear, and with a shield, shield so big he needed another man to carry it. He said, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. He's recognizing that God can fight your battle. All you got to do is give it to the Lord. Yes, you still got to do the activity. What does the Bible say about faith? Some people say, well, I'm going to have faith in God. I'm just going to sit back and relax. Well, you're going to get nothing. Faith the, without works is dead. Faith without works. You still got to do the work. You got to put the work in. If you don't put the work in, you're not going to get it. I don't care how much faith you got. But if you put the work in and you operate in faith, you go further than the work actually allows. 
your, your, the work that you're putting in will carry you further than what normal circumstances of doing that work should carry you. So you still put the work in. You still do the effort. But you're walking by faith in God. You're recognizing, I'm going to put this work in, but I'm doing it knowing that God will enhance what I'm doing. I'm going to have courage. I'm not going to be afraid. And I'm going to walk in the ways of God. The 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee. David already knows. I got the victory. <laughs> I'm going to beat this guy. And will take thy head from thee. So he's letting him know, I'm going to cut your head off. And I will give thy carcass to the host uh, of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the, uh, 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 the wild beasts. So David's saying, what you said you were going to do to me, guess what? That's what I'm going to do to you. And boy, is that such a, transform a, a, a transformative statement. How many times in Scripture do we see the thing that the enemy said he was going to do actually happen to the enemy? And what we're going to see here, we'll get to it in just a moment, but Saul is going to lose his head by his own sword. When we get to Esther, we're going to see Haman dying in the same gallow that he built to kill Mordecai. So oftentimes, what you'll see is the thing that the enemy sets up to defeat you, that's what happens to the enemy. And you just got to keep going by faith. Put the work in, put the time in. David went and grabbed something that he was familiar with. He grabbed his, them, them stones, and he grabbed his slingshot. All right? Um, and he, and he, he's letting them know, he said, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saves not with sword. This is what David is saying. David's like, no, I'm not going to get the victory. I'm not going to kill you with the sword. I'm going to cut your head off with your sword. But, but I'm going to kill you without a sword. All right? And without a spear. For the battle is the Lord's. Boy, if we can get that, if we can get that deep down, the thing that we are trying to accomplish is not something that we can do in our own strength. We need God to give us that victory. And we got to lean on him, depend on him, trust in him. Just give it all to God and watch him bring the victory. And it goes on and says, and he will give you into our hands. God's going to deliver you right into my hands. 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh uh, to meet David that David hastened and ran towards the army to meet the Philistine. So when the devil ran at him, guess what David do? He ran too. But he didn't run away. He ran to him. He said, you coming at me? Well, I'm coming at you. A lot of times what happens is we turn and run away. But David ran to him. At 49, and David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and, a, uh, and slung it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. Battle's over. One, see, see, God don't need no, you know, it didn't have to be like the, you know, he didn't have to have that uh, Mike Tyson Buster Douglas fight. It was, just, it was just a one punch, one second, bam, you're done. Uh, Goliath never got an opportunity to even put his hands on David. There was no battle. And that's what it is when God steps in. When God steps in, it's no struggle. Now, what you got to keep in mind was, how come David had a sling? And why did David know to grab some stones? Because David has used this sling, what? Before. Before. And I can imagine him back to when he's guarding those sheep. He's out there guarding the sheep. What is he doing? He's practicing. He's working with it. He's using it. He's putting some effort in. Why? Because he, he's trying to get as good at using it as he can. And then when you put the work in, and then the anointing comes upon your faith, it becomes just enormous, undefeatable. Okay? And so now... Goliath is sitting there with a stone sucking his forehead, laying on his ground. He fell on his face. 
uh, verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. David didn't have a sword. <clears throat> he only had the sling and the stone. But he knew where the sword was. Look at 51. Therefore, David ran and stood upon the Philistine, had to climb on top of that big old guy, and took his sword and drew it out of its sheath, therefore, and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they flee. What does the Bible say? Resist the devil and he will do what? He'll flee from you. That's exactly what happened. David resists this, this uh, 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 demonic, uh, uh, oversized Philistine. And when he got the victory, the rest of those uh, Philistine army ran. All right? And that's what happens in our life if we just continue to operate in the things of God. 52. And the men of Israel uh, and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistine until uh, they came to the valley and to the gates of Ekron and, and wounded the Philistines and, and uh, fell down uh, by the way of uh, Shemariam, even to Gath and to Ekron. All right, so now what happened? Now all the rest of the Israeli army is doing what? They're going out to fight. Because they were empowered by the faith that David had, and now they're going out. I, now, what do you think? It don't say it, but who you think also was in that in, in that uh, 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 gathering going out to fight? David's brother. David's brothers. It's like, ooh, my, my, that's, that's my brother. He did it. And now, they're, now you know, they're probably, oh, we can go fight now. But before, y'all were scared. And see, a lot of times, all we need is somebody with faith to, to just show us that we can go. And then now, all of a sudden, you got courage, too. You can encourage other people. People see your faith, now they're going to go. They're going to do. They're going to trust God. So keep on showing your faith, even in the midst of, of, of circumstances and obstacles that seem unfair. You keep showing faith. And your faith is going to encourage other people that they can go and run and fight against the enemy. All right, finishing this up. 53. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistine, and they spoiled their tents. They, what does spoiled mean? They got all the goods. Anything that they left is now ours. Okay? 54. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it into Jerusalem, but... Uh, put his armor up in his tent. So he took the armor uh, of, of Goliath as a souvenir, as a trophy, but he took the head of Goliath and brought it to Jerusalem. Look at 55. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistines, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, remember that's his, his uncle, and uh, Abner who was the son, uh, uh, let me read this again, uh, Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth. So he said to Abner, whose son is this youth? Who is this kid? Now, here's the thing. Saul already met David, remember? He met David when Saul had the evil spirit. But that shows you sometimes you can be in the presence of some people and they just don't even know you. They just ignoring you. You're there doing some work and all they see you is you just somebody here. They don't take any time to get to know who you are. Saul already was introduced to the person that was going to give him the victory, but he didn't pay it no mind. He just ignored David. He just said, this is that old guy coming here playing the instrument. Had no idea that the same guy is playing the instrument to get rid of the demon spirits is the same guy that used a sling to get rid of Goliath. All right? And Abner said, uh, as my soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. Abner didn't know who he was either. They're not paying any attention to this man that was going back and forth, David, to, to play out the evil spirits with his music. But now he's also play, uh, getting rid of the evil uh, uh, battle, Goliath, with his sling. David with a harp and with a sling. 
is fighting both the natural and the spiritual. Little things that you do. Little things that you have. He didn't have no tank, no bazooka. A sling and a harp. He didn't have no band. Right? He, this wasn't earth, wind, and fire. This was just a, a, a harp and a little sling. And he's beating it both on the natural and the spiritual. All right? Uh, 56. And the king inquired uh, thou whose son... Um, and so that, you know, he inquired, look at 57. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistines, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. So Abner went and he inquired. He found out who this man was. He got David and brought him to Saul. This is the second time David was brought to Saul. Now Saul knows who he is, though. Okay? And, and look what it says in 58. And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou? Boy, is that a great question. Whose son, whose daughter, whose child are you? Now, David is going to say Jesse, but actually he's also a what? A child of God. And the question could be said to you, whose child are you? Remember, Jesus said to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they said, we are children of Abraham, Jesus said, no, you're not. Your father is the devil. <coughs> See, we all are creations of God, but not all of us are children of God. Amen. Right? Only those that trust in God are children of God, but, though, but everybody is a creation of God. Right? And so Jesus pointed that out. There's a lot of people that are in godly places, but Jesus said, your father is the devil. Because why? He was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And you do the works of him. Our final verse. And Saul said unto him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. So let you know, he's come from where? Bethlehem. All right. Where did Je What was Jesus born? In a manger. Where? In Bethlehem. All right. So it's, it's, you, see the, you see the connection here. All right? And this is why he's a type or a metaphor or an analogy of what, what uh, uh, the Lord Jesus can do in our life. If we trust him. This is, all, this is a very familiar story. It's all about faith. Doing the things that you have to do. David was already doing the work though. He was working in the field. Taking care of the sheep. Fighting everything that came up against him. Practicing with a sling. And when the time came for him to really get the victory, to slay that thing which nobody thought he would be able to slay, God jumped in and anointed the work he was already doing to empower him to overtake that which nobody thought he would be able to overtake. And that's the beauty of it. And so we're concluding with this. Have faith in God even in the face of the impossible. And remember, faith, though, without works is dead. Put the work in. Put the time in. Put the effort in. Seek God. And then when the real struggle comes, that's when God arises and the anointing comes in. And then it overwhelms all the obstacles. And you get that which nobody thought you should get. And nobody thought David was going to beat Goliath, but he did. Not because he was stronger or better or anybody than anybody else. Because remember, he was he was a runt. He was smaller. And he was young. Gotcha. But God was with him. All right. We're not done. We're just going to stop. We got some more of this story to pick up on uh, on our next uh, gathering. Any comments or questions on what we talked about today? <laughs>